brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. The Spirit drove Jesus out into the desert, and he remained in the desert for forty days, tempted by Satan. He was among wild beasts, and angels ministered to him. After John the Baptist had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel of the Lord. Just last week, uh, a book arrived that I had ordered several months ago. It's entitled, A Manual for Spiritual Warfare. The principles this book teaches are so apropos for this first Sunday of Lent, as we go with our Savior Jesus Christ into the desert to meet and to confront our great adversary, the devil. The principles or rules for spiritual warfare are as follows. Know our enemy. Know our enemy's battle tactics. Know our commander-in-chief and our comrades in arm. And know our weapons and use them. Now I'm going to ask you for a little patience as I take a little longer time in the sermon today to explain these important rules. These rules are critical for us to know because brothers and sisters, whether we like it or not, we are at war. Ephesians 6, verse 12, states it clearly. Our battle is not against human forces, but against principalities and powers, the rulers of this world of darkness, the evil spirits in regions above. No matter who we are, whether we know it or not, we have a mortal enemy who wants to destroy us, not just in this life, but in the next. And no matter where we live on this planet, whether we see it or not, we are involved in a hotly contested battle and on a hotly contested battlefield, and we can't escape it. Even Jesus, the perfect Son of God, experienced it. And it's a spiritual war with critical, critical consequences in our everyday life in the here and now, and the outcome of the war will determine our eternal destiny forever. Think about forever one time, it'll blow your mind. The first rule of any type of warfare is this, know our enemy. See, this rule is important because how can we fight an adversary we can't identify? And worse yet, how can we avoid being a, a casualty in a battle roaring around us that we can't even recognize that we are in mortal danger? Our adversary is the devil and his army of demons. And our battle with the devil rages not just around us, but within us. A fierce conflict for the control of our minds, our hearts, our souls, and our eternal destiny. Now many in our modern secular world scoff and tell us that there is no devil, there is no battle. But brothers and sisters, we believe in Satan, his demons, and his demonic activity because of the accumulated evidence. First, throughout history, people of vastly different cultures around the globe have affirmed the reality of evil spirits, even when they have disagreed about most other spiritual realities. Also, many intelligent and rational people have testified to having personal encounters with demonic powers. Now, no doubt, some types of mental and physical illness have been wrongly attributed to demons today as in the past. And we can't deny that superstitions and legends about evil spirits, they still abound. But these misguided ideas about the devil don't in themselves disprove the existence of demons. Just as the age-old belief about a flat earth doesn't disprove that our planet exists. And these same modern skeptics, they demand scientific evidence, but 
Ask yourself, what kind of relevant ed evidence would science be capable of measuring? Natural sciences only measure what? Time, matter, energy, motion. The social scientists analyze human behavior. But devils don't have a physical body. So we can't put them in a test tube or subject them to psychoanalysis. The most that scientists can do is observe the effects of demons upon our physical world or upon human behavior. But sadly, the prevailing mentality among most of them is that they seek other explanations for demonic phenomena even when those explanations are utterly inadequate. The second reason we believe in the existence of the devil and his activity is because several passages in the Bible testify to the existence of the devil, his evil allies, and his demonic activity. In particular, the gospel uh, that we read today and that we can read in Matthew and Luke. As we heard in today's gospel, and as we could read in Matthew and Luke, our Lord's debate and confrontation with the devil in the wilderness was not some inner dialogue with himself about temptation. Also, Jesus referred to the devil several times in the Gospels. And a huge and indispensable part of his public ministry was what? Casting out evil spirits from people who were possessed by them. Some interpreters have claimed, oh, when Jesus uh, cast out evil spirits, Jesus simply was healing a physical or mental disorder misunderstood as demonic possession. But brothers and sisters, we only need to ask, or we only need to reply, that at least on one occasion we know in the scriptures, at Christ's command, the exercised demons left their human host to take possession of a herd of pigs. You can't cast out a medical disorder out of a man into a pig. If Jesus, God's son, knew what he was doing, as we believe, and if the gospel's accounts are historically reliable, as we believe, then we must conclude that the forces described in the gospels as evil spirits are precisely that. Third, we believe in the reality of demonic powers, because this belief has been the constant teaching of the church since the moment that Jesus founded the Catholic Church. The apostles and successors repeatedly have written about the devil. Through the centuries, popes and ecumenical councils and great theologians of the faith have consistently affirmed that the devil is real. Numerous great saints whose moral integrity and whose uh, mental health could hardly be uh, challenged or debated, they've testified to personal battles with demons. Also, the devil is referred to in our sacred worship, our liturgy, especially in the Our Father. The last petition is, deliver us from evil. And the fourth reason we believe in the existence of the devil is from our own personal experience of human events. Something supernaturally evil gets into people to have them do the horrific, inhuman, evil things they do. Whether you're talking about the Nazi concentration camps and the near annihilation of the Jewish population in Europe, or more recently, the horrific atrocities done by Islamic jihadist terrorists. So, who is this enemy that we're battling? The church teaches that Satan and the other demons were at first good angels, created by God before the creation of the world and the human race. They became evil by their own choice, radically rejecting God, His dominion, and His plan of salvation. And they cannot repent of their evil because their choice that they made against God is irrevocable. Sometimes you hear people say, well, maybe God will change their mind. You, can't, you have to understand, we as human beings learn progressively. One plus one equals two, two plus two equals four. And as we go through the progression, we can make a lot of mistakes. But angels see it all. They have all the information before them. So when they make a choice, it's irrevocable. Satan was the leader of these uh, rebels. And then God used St. Michael and the good angels to defeat Satan and his evil cohorts and to cast them out of heaven. 
And now they make their influence felt very strongly here in this world. Since demons are fallen angels, we know something about what they can and cannot do. Like humans, they have intellect and free will. But unlike humans, they are pure spirits. They don't have physical bodies as we do that would make them subject to physical illness or to death. And because they have an angelic nature, Demons have certain kinds of superhuman power. They are far, far superior to us in strength, in skill, intelligence, and knowledge. And since they have no physical bodies, they don't move through space or occupy space. But they can act on physical things and shift their attention and their activity instantly from one place to the next. Because, though, their angelic power and nature has been deformed and darkened by sin, the devils now abuse these great gifts from God by using them to injure and destroy human beings. Their entire purpose is to see as many human beings as possible join them in rebellion against God here so that they might be separated forever from God in eternity in hell. Now, although demons have remarkable powers, we know and we need to know that their powers are limited. For example, Satan and his evil minions, they don't know the future unless God reveals it to them. However, given their vast knowledge of events throughout the world and their vast knowledge of history, they can make accurate predictions and then act on them. So, who is it that we're fighting? It's the devil. He is not some evil deity equal in power to God who is all-powerful, supreme, all-knowing, eternal. Satan although powerful, is only a creature. And in the end, he's no match for God, his creator and his ultimate judge. This raises, though, one last question about devils and demonic activity. If God is supreme and infinitely more powerful than Satan and his hosts, then why doesn't God prevent them from doing evil on earth? Well, we could ask the same question of why God doesn't stop human beings from doing wicked deeds. The answer is twofold. First, it's because God respects free will, angelic and human. Second, evil's continual presence and activity among us, it's a mystery that we're not going to be able to fully figure out in this life. However, we can say this much. God allows evil because he's powerful enough to bring out the greatest good from the worst evil. The crucifixion of our Savior Jesus Christ is the perfect example. According to the Gospel, when Satan entered Judas, one of the twelve apostles, it said that Judas went out and betrayed Jesus. So the worst evil we can ever imagine, the torture and the murder of God's innocent Son, occurred through the devil's influence. Yet, the triumph of the empty tomb transformed the horror of the cross. Because of that moment, Satan and all his cohorts were forever thwarted. When Jesus rose from the dead, he displayed God's power to bring out of the greatest evil an even greater good, the world's redemption. And what was true for Jesus, brothers and sisters, is true for us. Our time in this earth provides the battleground for God to test, purify, strengthen, and perfect in us everything in order for us to be fit to share life with God in heaven. And to that end, then, devils serve as useful tools for God as they constantly test us so we can become purer, stronger, closer to perfection every time we resist the devil's temptation. Quoting St. Augustine, as an artist, God makes use even of the devil. The second principle of spiritual warfare, know our enemy's battle tactics. The devil uses various tactics, both ordinary and extraordinary. The ordinary activity of the devil, it's very subtle. It occurs within our thought life. The devil plants ideas within our minds to influence our reason, our memory, our imagination, and ultimately get to our willpower. Devils can suggest ideas through conversations, reading, or viewing certain images. Most often, in the ordinary way, devils influence us through temptation 
by enticing us to sin. They get our attention through a thought to arouse our emotions to get us to act sinfully. Devils tempt us in various ways. First, devils tempt us through deception. In John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus called the devil a liar and the father of lies. In Ephesians 6, 11, the apostle Paul speaks of the devil's wiles. And again, in his second letter to the Corinthians 11, 13, St. Paul states that the devil masquerades as an angel of light. See, very often, a lie stands at the heart of, the t uh, of every temptation the uh, uh, devil presents to us. Remember how Satan deceived Eve in, the, Eve in the Garden of Eden? When the serpent tempted her, he did so with lies about God's motive and the consequences, the serious consequences of sin. In a similar way, the devil lies to us by telling us, for example, Ah, oh, go ahead and do it. What could be wrong with it? Everybody's doing this. Second, the devil tempts us through accusation. Revelation 12.10 calls the devil the accuser of Christians as well as a liar. See, by making accusations against us and others, which usually are false, the devil acts like a bully, trying to pressure us into sin. For example, wow, your situation is hopeless. You might as well end it all by suicide. Or, you know what, your husband really doesn't appreciate you, but your boss does. You might take him up on that invitation. Third, the devil tempts us through doubt. His strategy is to insinuate into our thoughts various doubts about God, about his truth, and his will for us. It was a tactic he also used uh, against Eve. Remember when the serpent said to Eve, did God really tell you this stuff? He knew what God said, but he twisted it, created a doubt. He took the same approach when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. Fourth, the devil tempts us through enticement. The devil brings to us, uh, brings to our attention, very attractive things, and he suggests that we obtain these attractive things through illicit, sinful means. So just as he did with Eve, the devil holds out a very good thing of God's creation, and he says, "It's good." Cool. It's good. Brothers and sisters, everything God created is good. But you know how the devil entices us? He entices us by not having us ask the far more important good. Is this good thing or experience good for me? Does it take me closer to Jesus and closer to the kingdom? Or is it leading me away? And then finally the devil tempts us through provocation. He plants thoughts or arranges circumstances that can provoke us to pride or anger or lust or even despair. Go to the book of Job in the Old Testament. The book of Job tells how God allowed Satan to tempt Job to despair by trying to provoke him to tremendous, tremendous adversity. But when the loss of Job's possessions, his health, all his children, when it didn't achieve the results that Satan sought, Satan resorted to another form of provocation, using the harsh condemnatory words of dear friends and even his wife. Now besides the ordinary demonic activity through temptation, there's also extraordinary demonic activity. The first is infestation, which is a term for demonic activity connected to a particular location or object. People, for example, who've lived in infested homes have seen objects moving, levitating, flying through the air, disappearing, rematerializing uh, re in another place. Or they've smelled very noxious, offensive odors that have no source. Or heard inexplicable noises such as crashes or hysterical laughter or screams. You know, my priesthood, I know several people who've experienced such demonic Phenomenon. The next is oppression, which describes the demonic attacks on a, vi a victim's external life. Influences, for example, on his body and health, or his finances, or his work situation, or upon his family, or social relations. It may even include physical assaults, 
such as invisible blows to the body or invisible pushes out of bed or a push down the stairs when no one's around or mysterious scratches on the skin for no explanation. You know, a number of the great saints, such as St. Anthony of the Desert, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of and more recently, more modern, St. Padre Pio, all testify to enduring such kinds of assaults. Obsession is another extraordinary demonic activity. Obsession refers to a more severe and relentless form of the struggle in a victim's interior life, a wrestling with disturbing thoughts that the enemy plants there. And this inner torment suffered while awake sometimes, or in nightmares, they become so intense that the sufferer sometimes feels like he or she's going insane. And the victim also may experience visible, visual or auditory hallucinations, as well as persistent temptation to suicide. Now, it needs to be noted here that the symptoms I just spoke about may have mental or physical causes rather than spiritual ones. That's why the church always insists that those who are experiencing such obsessive afflictions first must have a very thorough physical and psychological examination by very competent professionals, professionals before they're going to conclude that this person is under attack from demons. And finally, possession. Possession is the last form of extraordinary demonic activity. It's the rarest and most powerful form. It involves periodic episodes in which an evil spirit controls the body of another. Oftentimes, the victim doesn't, is not even aware of it. There are several accounts in the Gospels about demonic oppression. Uh, a demonic possessed person may engage in bizarre bodily contortions not normally possible for the human body. How many people saw the exorcist? I want you to know that is true. It's happened in exorcisms. It may be that the body levitates. I have a priest friend, he's an exorcist back in Pennsylvania. Just six years ago, or six months ago, a young girl has an appointment with his mother, her mother brought him in. He didn't know, but as soon as she walked in the office, she stuck on the seat. I said, what did you do? He said, well, first I had to calm my secretaries down. <laughs> he said, then I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, little girl, come down. And he exercised her. A demon-possessed person may uh, act with superhuman strength, or may groan and hiss, or make uh, guttural animal noises. An alien voice may speak to the possessed person, even though it's not using the person's vocal cords. Oftentimes, you're dealing with hidden knowledge. Or, literally, the person speaks in foreign languages that they never learned. At the same time, as in the case of infestation, disturbing and violent physical phenomena may take place. And finally, the victim of demonic possession may use very, very obscene language or exhibit an extreme and sometimes violent revulsion to the names of Jesus and Mary. Uh, to the sacred rites of the church, or to a consecrated host, or to relics of saints, or to sacramentals like, like holy water. Now, it's important to remember this, that a demon can never possess someone in the sense of owning a person. All human beings belong to God alone and are God's possession. But in cases of demonic possession, the enemy becomes a temporary usurper, occupying human bodies where the Holy Spirit is meant to dwell. Now, why does the devil possess someone? Mostly, brothers and sisters, to discourage and intimidate the faith of other people who are witnesses. To intimidate, to make you begin to doubt your faith in God. The third rule of spiritual warfare. Know our commander-in-chief and know our comrades in arm. And this principle is very self-explanatory. Brothers and sisters, we have the all-powerful God, the Holy Trinity, all the good angels, the Blessed Mother St. Joseph, and all the communion of saints fighting for us and defending us. In his letter to the Romans, chapter 8, St. Paul reminds us, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor present things, or future things, 
nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's just when God and all God's holy people and all God's holy things are for us, nothing can be against us. Which brings us to the fourth rule of spiritual warfare. Know your weapons and use them. Our weapons are prayer. Prayer of all kinds, especially prayers that are connected to defending us from evil. For example, the rosary or the prayer of St. Michael the Archangel. Reading and meditating on the scriptures. Fasting, almsgiving, acts of penance and mortification. Charity to others. See, these aren't just kind of nice things that the church says, you know, this might be a good thing to do. It is a must that we do it. Charity to others, sacramentals such as holy water, or wearing a scapular, or I say Benedict medal. Obedience of all Ten Commandments. You know, a lot of people think, well, I'm doing pretty good. I got seven out of ten. You know, baseball, that's a high average. It don't matter. It's ten out of ten striving to do it all the time. And especially the celebration of the Sacrament of Confession and the Holy Eucharist. You know, Brother Sisters, there's a book, I actually alluded to it before in a sermon, called Begone Satan. It's a record of an exorcism that took place in 1927 in Northern Iowa. And all this demonic, extraordinary activity I talked about was part of that exorcism. The body would fly up to the roof. And then they pulled it down and it would blow up like a balloon ready to pop. And then it would shrink down and crush the bed. So the priest, Father of the office, the exorcist, had people help him. But the devil, you see, is always trying to, to distract him from the process because he didn't want to be expelled. So one of the ways he distracted, not just those phenomena, but he, the victim was lying there, a demon-possessed person, and then the person spoke, not through lips, just spoke, a voice came out, and started naming all the sins of the people who were helping out with the exorcism. Imagine how mortifying that be, that your worst secrets were pouring forth. And Father Theophilus immediately recognized it. He said, in the name of Christ, silence. Why are you talking about the little fish? Why are you talking about their sins? How about talking about my sins? I'm the priest. You know what the devil said? I know nothing confessed in the sacrament of confession. I know nothing any sin confessed there. Of course, brothers and sisters. Jesus poured forth his blood on the cross that washes us clean and covers us and protects us. That's why you want to hit that sacrament often. And of course, the supreme prayer, the Holy Eucharist. These weapons are incredibly effective against Satan and his demons. But we got to be on guard not to let the devil convince us that we should put down our weapons. Don't let Satan and his allies whisper in our ears through many voices in this world that these spiritual weapons, ah, they're archaic, old school, medieval, or, you know, we're living in a more civilized, a more modern time. And because we are more enlightened now, we don't need to use those weapons anymore. They're not superfluous. They're integral to the battle. So brothers and sisters, on this first Sunday of Lent, as we go with our Savior Jesus into the desert to confront our mortal enemy, the devil, remember the four rules of spiritual warfare. Know our enemy. Know his battle tactics. Know our commander-in-chief and our comrades in armor with fighting force. And then know and use our spiritual weapons. If we keep those rules in mind of spiritual warfare, and we practice them faithfully. And guess what, brothers and sisters? We can tell Satan, all his demons, just go to hell. 